Good afternoon, class. This is going to be Chapter 4, Lecture. It's a very long chapter. It's going to include medical terminology, human anatomy, lifespan development. I'm going to just brush through some of the slides that include just terms because you'll be able to read more about those in your book and we'll go over them as class as well. So just bear with me. It's going to be a long lecture. All right, so we're going to be defining a lot of different terms here. The key to uh, medical terminology is knowing part of the word. If you know part of the word, most of the time you can figure out what it's referring to. Uh, for instance, Brady is the second term on this list. It means slow. And that could be you know, slow anything, as you'll learn in your book. I'm just going to kind of breeze through the next few slides. And we're going to also get into, you know, def defining the different areas of the body. That'll also be something you read more about in your book. All right, so the next objectives we're going to hit on is going to be to apply knowledge of basic medical terminology to interpret common medical terms. We're going to describe the standard of anatomical position and its purpose. Identify the four major body cavities. Describe the anatomy contained in each body cavity. We're going to describe the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system. Describe the anatomy and physiology of the circulatory system. Describe and func describe the anatomy and function of the musculoskeletal system. Describe the anatomy and function of the nervous system. Describe the anatomy and function of the digestive system. Describe the anatomy and function of the reproductive system. Describe the anatomy and function of the urinary system. Describe the anatomy and function of the skin. Describe the anatomy and function of the endocrine system. Describe the major phases of lifespan development. Give an illustration of the human body. Proper, properly describe the location of random injuries as presented by the instructor. Demonstrate an awareness, respect for cultural differences and diversity within the human body. Value the importance of using the standard of anatomical terms when describing and documenting illness and injuries. All right, let's get started with medical terminology, guys. This is uh, it's just a lot of information I'm going to throw at you here. You'll pick up a lot more when you're going through your book. All right, so two categories of medical terms. Descriptive, that means they describe the shape, size, and color or function of whatever part of the body they're speaking of. Three parts of terms. You're going to have the root, the prefix, and the suffix. I'm going to give you just a few seconds to take a look at this table. It's also in your book. Like I said, just refer to your book for tables such as this. That we can't spend all the time we need to go over them on this lecture. All right, so why do you think it's useful to learn the medical root words, prefixes, and suffixes? You have a patient with a history of endocarditis. What do you think this condition involves? All right, so let's uh, break down the word. So endo means inside. Um card that would be the heart and itis as inflammation or swelling so put those three words together and you got some you know swelling or inflammation inside the heart 
All right, what do you guys think about this next one? Just look it up in your uh, chart and see what you think. Just make a note of it, please. All right, positional and directional terms. All right, uh, so anatomy is the study of the body structure. Anatomical position is defined as the standard reference body uh the standard reference position for the body in the study of anatomy. The reason we put uh, the body in the anatomical position is so I can describe an injury or anything on the body with very specific terms and anybody can know exactly where and what I'm talking about. Our anatomical position is when the body is standing erect facing the observer which would be you. Arms and hands are down at the side. Palms of hands are facing forward. The right and left always described as seen from the patient's perspective, not from your perspective. So it's the right and left of the patient. Just going to move on from this one. You see it's describing flexion, extension, hyperextension. Again, I'm going to get you to refer to your book for this figure. All right, positional and directional terms. Anterior, that's always the front of the body. Posterior is the back of the body or body part, whatever we're describing. Midline, that's an imaginary vertical line. Use the body into right and left halves. Just picture it going right between your eyes, through your nose, all the way down the rest of your body. Medial always means towards the midline of your body so that would mean if there's something medial on your arm it'd be medial to whatever point they're describing lateral that means you're pushing away from the body so it's further out superior towards the top of the head inferior is always towards the feet proximal is closer to the torso distal is farther away from the torso supine is uh, laying flat on your back with your face up prone is laying face down the recovery position we referenced in an earlier lecture common is going to be the left or right lateral recumbent position most common is the left lateral recumbent position just because it works for almost any patient you encounter. Obviously aside from the ones with major traumatic injuries. 
All right, so positional and directional terms. Semi-fowler's position, that's when the patient's sitting up at an angle. That's generally how they're going to be sitting on a stretcher in an ambulance. Trendelic bird position is basically the opposite. They're supine at an angle with the feet elevated. All right, so this uh, shows the patient laying in a supine position. The provider at the head is just holding in line spinal stabilization, and they're just doing an assessment on the patient. This is a prone patient. A patient placed in a recovery position. Uh, in the recovery position, this is the lateral recumbent position I was talking about. Just keep in mind, this is a great position to put somebody that's unconscious, that you do not suspect to sustain trauma. It keeps the airway clear, allows anything to drain out of the mouth that needs to. All right, so this is a patient in the semi-fowler's position. Like we said earlier, it's typically somebody on a stretcher. This is somebody in a Trendelenburg position. If you notice, the feet are elevated. The head is uh, lower than the feet. All right. So why might you use uh, why might the use of positional and directional terms be important as an EMR? Um, I mean, if you're describing an injury to a paramedic or EMT that you've arrived on scene with, you can easily describe the location of the injury. And it's a language that, you know, is easily understood between two different people. All right, so when might using simple terms be more appropriate than medical terminology? You always want to use simple terminology when you're speaking to individuals that don't have experience with medical terminology. You want them to be able to understand what you're talking about. Okay, we're going to do an overview of the human body. Our physiology is defined as the function of the body and its many systems, regions of the body, major internal structures, and general location of each. Four major, the four major body cavities are cranial, thoracic, abdominal, and pelvic. All right, this is a animation. I'm not sure if it'll come through in a lecture or not, but this is a animation of ankle flexion, dorsiflexion and extension. Alright, ankle elbow flexion and Elbow pronation and supination. Pronation. Now this is going to be hand opposition. This means closing and opening the hand. Alright, humorous circumduction. Just watch up at the area of the shoulder. Humorous rotation, wrist circumduction, wrist flexion, Again, we're going to refer to our book for this one. Alright, just take a look at all the different cavities of the body. Cranial cavity is going to be up at the head. Thoracic cavity is at the chest. 
abdominal cavity is obviously in the abdom abdominal region. The pelvic cavity is below that. Alright, cranial cavity houses the brain and its specialized membranes. The thoracic cavity is known as the chest cavity. It's enclosed by the rib cage, holds and protects lungs, heart, and the great vessels, part of the windpipe or trachea, and part of the esophagus. This is just a figure showing the major structures of the chest cavity. Again, I'll get you to refer to your book. Our abdominal cavity it lies between the chest cavity and the pelvic cavity. It holds the stomach, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, spleen, small intestine, and most of the large intestine. Diaphragm, that's going to be the muscle we use in breathing. It separates the chest cavity from the abdominal cavity. Pelvic cavity, protected by the bones of the pelvic girdle, houses the urinary bladder, portions of the large intestine, and internal reproductive organs. Just take a look at this figure. Again, you can reference it in your book. Overview of the human body continued is abdominal quadrants. So the abdomen is going to be split into four different quadrants. You get the right upper quadrant, which is always going to be in reference to the patient's right. It includes the liver, gallbladder, part of the small and large intestine. Left upper quadrant, stomach, spleen, and part of the large intestine, also part of the liver. Right lower quadrant <laughs> contains the appendix, part of the small and large intestine. Left lower quadrant, part of the small and large intestine. This is a figure uh, splitting the body into quadrants. You can take a look at it and see as you're looking at someone where their or internal organs are going to lie. Again, you're going to need to reference this in your book for you know more detailed study. All right, some organs are solid. Some organs are uh, solid while others are hollow. This comes into a, um, a lot more importance when you're dealing with trauma. We'll get into that in our trauma section. All right, how might the knowledge of body cavities and organ placement assist you in assessing a patient with a stab wound or abdominal pain? That's just something to you know think about. If you've got a stab wound, you're able to know what underlying organs may have been damaged by the stabbing itself. In abdominal pain, you may know what organs may be in distress based on where the pain is coming from. All right, let's move into our different body systems. All right, the respiratory system is divided into upper and lower. Upper airway includes the nose, mouth, and larynx. Lower airway is the trachea, lungs, bronchi, bronchioles, bronchioles, alveoli, and associated muscles. That will be your intercostal muscles and your diaphragm. This is a figure showing the major uh, structures of the restore system. You can refer to that in your book. All right, body systems continued. Uh, still in the restore system. What are the functions of the restore system? Gas exchange. It warms, filters, and multi mo moisturizes your air. Minimizes possible aspiration. Aspiration is a foreign body going into your lower airway. All right, let's talk about some complications. Uh, perfusion adversely affected if the patient is not breathing or adequately, not breathing adequately or stops breathing. Diseases and injury disrupt the delivery of oxygen. We'll get more into that when we're covering the respiratory system specifically. Circular, circulatory system, this includes your heart, blood vessels in your blood arterial I uh, say so your circulatory system's got uh, two different sides if you'll think about it like that you've got your arterial side that carries oxygenated blood to your body 
you get your venous side, which returns unoxygenated um, blood back to your body. All right, so the functions of it, your circulatory system are to carry well oxygenated blood and other nutrients to the body cells, assist with the removal of waste and carbon dioxide from cells. Complications. Dysfunctions of the structures leads to poor perfusion and the buildup of waste. This is a figure showing your circulatory system. Arteries are represented as the red veins or your blue. Major structures of the heart. Again, you can reference your book for this. All right, the components of the cardiac conduction system. It says you can see all that's going to be in yellow. You're going to start with your SA node and you're going to move on. That's not something that's terribly important for the EMR section but you can read more about it in your book and we'll go over it in class as well All right, musculo musculoskeletal sorry guys had an issue with my speaker here musculoskeletal system primary structures are the bones muscles tendons and ligaments functions are to provide structure support and protection for the body and its internal organs it allows for body movements. The skeletal system produces disease-fighting white blood cells. These are the major structures of the skeletal system. Again, refer to your book. Major structures of the skull. Uh, your axial skeleton, skull, vertebrae, rib cage, sternum are all included in this. Your appendicular skeleton includes your upper and lower extremities, shoulder, and your pelvic girdles. Skeletal muscle represents about 40-50% of your weight depending on body composition. This is a figure showing the muscular system. All right, so if you look at the top circle, that's going to be your skeletal muscle. That's what it looks like. You can see that it's uh, pretty well organized. Skeletal muscle is what you would consider to be voluntary. Cardiac muscle is your next circle. It's considered to be involuntary, meaning it beats on its own. Smooth muscle for the most part is also involuntary. All right, blood vessels are constructed of smooth muscle. It's capable of constricting and dilating. This is just a figure that represents how that works. Uh, your nervous system. This is going to include your brain, spinal cord, and your nerves. Alright, it's going to control your body movements. Interpret sensations, like if you touch something hot, it relays that you're getting burned. Regulates body activities. Generates your memories and thoughts. nervous system is split into a couple different sections. You got your central nervous system, which includes your brain and spinal cord, and your peripheral nervous system, uh, which includes your sensory, um, which are motor, which refers to you moving things, that's your outgoing, and your autonomic, which is your involuntary processes, your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system. This is a figure showing the major structures of your central nervous system. Alright, 
This is a figure showing the divisions of your spinal column. Alright, let's move into the digestive system. So the major structures of the digestive system are the esophagus, the stomach, small intestines, and large intestines. Functions are to break down food for energy and remove waste products from your body. This figure shows the major structures of the digestive system. Alright, reproductive system. It's going to be split into male and female. Structures of the male reproductive system are going to be the testes and the penis. Female reproductive system is going to be uh, consisting of the ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, and vagina. Functions of the reproductive system are going to be hormone production, gestation, and development. The structure describes the male reproductive system. You can also reference this in your book. Some major structures of the female reproductive system. Uh, urinary system. Kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra. Functions of the urinary system are to remove chemical waste from the body. Help balance water and salt levels in the blood. Major structures of the urinary system are listed in this figure. Uh, now we're going to move on to the, <coughs> excuse me, into the integumentary system. This is basically your skin and associated structures. Um, so we got the skin, the nails, the hair, sweat glands, oil glands, and mammary glands. Skin is the largest organ of the body, split up in three layers, your epidermis, which is what you see when you look down at your skin, your dermis, which is directly below that, your subcutaneous layer, which is up under that. It also houses the other structures of the integumentary system. So more functions of the skin are going to be protection, also regulation of body temperature, Sensation of temperature and heat, cold, touch, pain, and pressure, regulation of body fluids. Right, the anatomy of the skin, uh, this figure shows that. Again, you can look in your book for this. All right, we're moving on to the endocrine system. This is going to include your thyroid, pituitary, and adrenal glands. Um, adrenal glands are going to excrete epinephrine, which is included in your fight or flight response. Pancreas secretes, secretes insulin. Also going to include your gonads, and that includes male and female. Endocrine system continued. Its functions are metabolism and regulation, physical size and strength, hair growth, voice pitch, and reproduction. This figure shows the major structures of the endocrine system. All right, how might an injury to the skeletal system affect the cardiovascular system? All right, so if you get a injury to the skeletal system, it can affect it in a lot of different ways. Uh, say you have an injury to your hip or what we would call a femur. You can lose a large amount of blood. And it'll actually, you know, cause the cardiovascular system to be affected. Right, how might a injury to the cranium affect the respiratory system? So your Respiratory centers are located inside your brain, obviously. If you've got increased swelling in your cranium, it can cause just a lot of different issues, cause increased pressure. It can cause the respiratory system to be affected. And what resources exist for increasing your knowledge of anatomy and physiology? Why might it be 
why might more knowledge be helpful uh, there's an unlimited amount of resources that exist for this you can look on youtube you can reference any number of books the more you know about the human body the more you know about how it works and how injuries and illnesses affect it uh, we're going to move into lifespan development All right, the biological portion of lifespan development is includes the physical body Cognitive includes the mind. This, uh, psychosocial involves how a person interacts with surroundings. Different stages of development are the neonate, that's birth to 28 days. Infant, that's birth up to one year. Toddler is one to three years. Preschool, three to six years old. And school age is six to 12. This is going to be something that you need to commit to memory. You can find this in your book. Just make sure you study it very well. Right, this is going to be a continuation of lifespan development. After you get out of school age, you're going to go into adolescence. That's going to be 12 to 18 years old. Early adulthood is 20 to 30 years old. Middle adulthood is 31 to 60 years old. And late adulthood is 60 up until the end of life or death however you want to define it all right so neonates uh, they're sensitive to cold temperatures they're prone to separation anxiety visual assessments of these individuals are most productive all right toddlers this is one to three years old they're starting to feel a sense of independence they do have stranger anxiety they experience severe separation anxiety this is just a image of an infant toddler. All right, preschooler is three to six years old. They start to develop concrete thinking skills. They're able to think for themselves. Um, they still need reassurance. They may not have developed a lot of confidence yet. They respond very well to simple explanations. They experience severe separation anxiety. Um, you're going to do well with a head to toe assessment or toe to head assessment on these individuals so they can start to feel more comfortable as you move up towards their head. They can be more sensitive to that. They're typically quite modest. They don't like to expose their body. Uh, like I said, you just got to make them feel comfortable. School aged children at 6 to 12 years old. They have a basic understanding of the body and its function. They're able to communicate and understand more complex ideas. They're very literal. They're aware and afraid of death and dying as well as pain. School-aged children are more likely to understand what you're doing to them, and they're better able to cooperate with you. They can still experience anxiety and make an assessment more difficult, though. All right, adolescents, they've got a basic understanding of anatomy and physiology they're able to express process complex ideas they are risk takers especially young boys they're afraid of disfigurement and permanent injury they believe they're immortal indestructible they want to be treated as adults it's just a figure showing two adolescents just keep in mind a lot of times they're very modest about their bodies All right, early adulthood, 20 to 30 years old, peak in their uh, health. They're always generally very active. A lot of these individuals are going to be involved in traumatic injuries and uh, accidents. Just again, they still feel like they're indestructible, especially the males. It's just a figure of individuals in early adulthood. Middle adulthood is 31 to 60 years old. Starting to lose a little bit of their sight and hearing. A little bit of decrease in height. Hair begins to turn gray. Permanent wrinkles appear on the skin. Man, that kind of hit home. I guess I'm entering that myself. This just shows a couple of in middle adulthood. 
late adulthood is going to be 60 plus. It goes anywhere from the age of 60 to the end of life or death, however you want to call it. The continued uh, decline in their ability to see, hear, taste, and smell. Mobility may become difficult. Awareness of mortality or death. Uh, they start becoming aware that they're coming towards the end of life. Decrease in the ability to perceive pain. A lot of times they just have multiple illnesses and it overlaps, causing them to be, you know, on different kinds of medicine at the same time. All right, considering developmental differences, how would your assessment approach to a preschooler who was fallen from a bike differ from an adolescent who has sustained a skateboard-related injury? Now, just think about it. How is the preschooler going to be able to uh, communicate with you? Are they going to be aware of what has happened to them versus the older uh, child? So what happens if a parent is not on scene with a preschooler? What are some considerations you may need to take into account? Right, what if other teens are on scene with the adolescent? What are some things you want to think about? Just keep in mind they may be very modest. They may not want to be exposed in front of anyone. Uh, so you may want to wait until you get them in an ambulance to be able to assess the injury fully. Right, let's get into a summary. All right, medical profession has unique language with words, roots, suffixes, and prefixes specific to medical terminology. Descriptions related to illness, injury, and patient care <clears throat> refer to a patient in an anatomical position. Just make sure you are very familiar with the anatomical position and how to describe it. Four major body cavities are the cranial, thoracic, abdominal, and pelvic. They contain the major organs and can hide significant blood loss. The cranium contains the brain and soft tissues surrounding the brain. The thorax contains the heart, lungs, as well as the major vessels. The abdomen contains the vital organs, the liver, the spleen, pancreas, gallbladder, and intestines. The pelvic cavity contains the bladder, intestines, uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries of the female. Respiratory system. This includes the upper airway, the larynx, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli. The respiratory system is responsible for movement of air into and out of the body and exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. The primary muscle is the diaphragm. All right, cardiovascular system. This includes the heart, the vessels, the blood. It's responsible for transportation of oxygen-rich blood and nutrients. All right, musculoskeletal system. This includes the bones, the muscles, and the connective tissue. Uh, connective tissue, guys, is ligaments and tendons. Provides extra support. Allows for mobility, protection against injury. and helps support the immune system. All right, the nervous system includes the brain, spinal cord, nerves, central nervous system, which includes brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, or PNS, which includes the nerves. Allows for control of all movements and function of vital systems. All right, the digestive system includes the esophagus, the stomach, and the intestines. Primary function is to break down food so that it can be properly metabolized and as a means to eliminate solid waste. The reproductive system includes the testes and penis in the male, the ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, and vagina in the female. It's responsible for these for producing hormones necessary for production, reproduction and maintaining the structures to support gestation of the fetus and the female. Urinary system includes the kidneys, the ureters, bladder, and urethra. It's responsible for the filtration and removal of waste from the blood. It helps to maintain water and salt levels in the blood. The integumentary system, this includes your skin, structures that support hair, nail growth, sweat glands, oil ducts. Three layers of skin are the epidermis, which is what you see when you look down at your skin, the dermis, and the subcutaneous tissue. 
It helps protect from harmful pathogens and maintain a stable body temperature. Right, the endocrine system, that's your hormone producing glands, which include your thyroid, pituitary, and adrenal glands. Responsible for the regulation of important body processes. The human body grows and develops through several different stages. Significant biological, cognitive, and psychological changes at each stage of development. The better you understand the changes, the better you will be at assessing the patients and providing proper care. I'll get you to refer to your book for this one. It's just an uh, overview of skeletal anatomy. Supination. And extension. That's flexion. That's extension. Inversion. Eversion.